What is the A, B, C, D of a personal forest system? A. The anchorage. B. The body support, which is the harness. C. The connections. And D. The deceleration device, which is an energy absorber. This is a normal twin tail lanyard. This is the connector. This is the lanyard. This is the energy absorber. This is another connector that goes back to your D-ring. Your personal four arrest system should not be anchored onto a linear scaffold that works. Okay. Do not anchor your personal four arrest system to sprinkler pipes. And anyway, this is the wrong way to use your scaffold. Do not anchor your personal fall arrest system on standard guardrails. Do not hook up your personal fall arrest systems to electrical fixtures. Do not Hook up your personal fall arrest system to rungs on the ladder. Do not hook up your personal fall arrest system with another ladder. Poor maintenance of your fall protection equipment can cause you great problems when you actually need it to arrest your fall. Now what are some of the common uh, maintenance issues? One, frayed webbings, cuts on your webbing, corrosion, faulty snap hooks that don't work, damaged lanyards, damaged or tempered energy absorbers, or deployed energy absorbers. Take care of your equipment. They will take care of you. Guys, one of the common way high accidents is falling from the ladder. Do not underestimate this. Falling from structures is another common accident in our industry. Accidents happen frequently also on scaffolds and other temporary working platforms. Three types of ladders commonly found on work sites. Portable step ladders, portable vertical access ladders, fixed vertical ladders. Now if you are satisfied that all reasonably practicable measures have been taken effectively, see, all taken effectively, you can endorse on the permit to work and then forward it to the authorised manager. As a work and height safety assessor, before you endorse a permit to work, you must go and inspect the site together with the supervisor in order to assess the actual location where the hazardous work and height is going to be carried out. Ladders are used very often in many work situations to provide access to height. If not used properly, ladders can lead to serious or fatal accidents at work. From the Code of Practice for Working Safely at Heights, these are the safety guidelines for, the lad for using ladders safely. Common causes of accidents uh, in using ladders, poor construction, unsound material, and materials of inadequate strength. 
or setting up ladders in passageways and doorways, ladders near the edge of an open floor, and working on ladders continuously for extended periods of time. Overreaching. And carrying hand tools when ascending and descending the ladder. These are some of the uh, common accidents that happen in the use of ladders. The ladder needs to be secured from swaying and slipping. Now, it's climbing up the ladder. It needs to maintain at least three points of contact. One, two, three. Some basic requirements when using the ladder. Ensure that the height to base ratio is about four is to one. Four vertical to one horizontal. Do not carry tools when climbing the ladder. Maintain three points of contact. Get your assistant to pass you the tool. What are some of the common accidents that happen in the use of tower scaffold? For one, unprotected edges. Now, unprotected edges are hazardous because the worker is not protected from a fall on that open edge. Please put back the guardrails. Another common problem is unlocked caster wheel. When a caster wheel is not locked, the stability of the tower scaffold is compromised. Working from an unstable working platform is unsafe. Another hazardous practice that people like to do is moving the tower scaffold when somebody is working on top. Other common problems in the use of power scaffold is the hazard when climbing the ladder. The 10 components of the 4 prevention plan can be found in the Code of Practice for Working Safely at Heights. It's a good code of practice. You find it in Chapter 3, the components of a 4 prevention plan. Number 1, you must have a policy for 4 prevention. A policy states in unambiguous terms the organization's approach and commitment towards fall protection. Number two, responsibilities. Now, responsibilities state which competent person is responsible for which component of the fall prevention plan. Number three, risk management. This means hazard identification and risk assessment. Now, hazard identification and risk assessment needs to be done in order for you to know what risk you're actually going to deal with and what plans you're going to use to abate them. Number four, risk control measures. It deals with the hierarchy of controls. It says how your organization is going to use the hierarchy of controls to deal with the various hazards that's present in your work site. Number five, safe work procedures. Safe work procedures, SWP, is a very common form of administrative control that is used to tell people and tell your old people how you're going to carry out a certain work safely. Six, the use of personal protective equipment. Now, PPE is a last resort, and that's the reason why PPE needs to be good. PPE is the last resort, and it needs to be maintained, it needs to be taken care of, and it needs to be used properly. Number seven, inspection and maintenance of these PPE. Number eight, Instruction and training, because training needs to be undertaken by the workers in order to carry out their work safely and efficiently. Number nine, in the event of an accident or incident, there's accident and incident investigation. How does your organization investigate all these incidents and accidents in order not to repeat them? And lastly, work at high, you've got to deal with contingencies. Emergency response. Point number 10 of the fall prevention plan is emergency response. How does your organization deal with an emergency on site? All these can be found in the Code of Practice for Working Safely at Harvest. 
some of the duties of a responsible person as prescribed in the workplace safety and health work at height regulations are as such. It needs to ensure that no work at height is carried out where it is reasonably practicable to carry the work safely otherwise than at height. That's in regulation four. In regulation seven, it states that it shall, you shall have to ensure that a person working at height is under immediate supervision of a competent person for that work. In regulation 10, he has to ensure that a person using a travel restraint system is trained and that the system is of good construction and so on. In regulation 11, he has to ensure that the four arrest system is of good construction and every person using the system is trained. In regulation 12, he has to ensure that the inspection of travel restraint systems or four arrest systems are being carried out by somebody who is competent. In regulation 16, he is to ensure the safety of roof work. In regulation 18, is also to ensure the safe use of ladders. In regulation 20, he is to appoint a competent person as the authorized manager for hazardous work at height. To also appoint a competent person as a work at height safety assessor for hazardous work at height. And to ensure that a permit to work system is implemented for hazardous work at height. Three systems commonly used in work sites to prevent fall from height accidents as defined in the Code of Practice for Working Safely at Heights are as follows. 1. In Chapter 6, four prevention systems. In Chapter 8, travel restraint systems. In Chapter 9, four arrest systems. These three systems, stated in the CP, are commonly used to prevent work at height accidents. This is an aluminum tower scaffold. This is a caster wheel. This is a horizontal brace. This is a stabilizer on our rigger. This is a diagonal brace. This is an inclined ladder. This is a trap door. This is the top rail, this is the mid rail, that's the two wall. In the Workplace Safety and Health Work Height Regulations 2013, it's in the schedule. The workplaces required to have a fall prevention plan are any work site, any shipyard, any factory engaged in the processing or manufacturing of petroleum, petroleum products, petrochemicals, or petrochemical products. Any premise where the bulk storage of toxic or flammable liquid is carried on by way of trade or for the purpose of gain and which has the storage capacity of 5,000 or more cubic meters for such toxic or flammable liquid. Any factory engaged in the manufacturing of fluorine, chlorine, hydrogen fluoride, or carbon monoxide or synthetic polymers. Any factory engaged in the manufacturing of pharmaceutical products or their intermediates. Any factory engaged in the manufacturing of semiconductor wafers. Any factory not falling within any of the classes of workplaces described in paragraphs 1 to 7 and in which 50 or more persons are employed. The top three contributing factors of work height accidents are these. One, lack of safe work procedures. Number two, lack of or improper use of personal fall protection equipment. Number three, 
a poor working environment. The fall hazard in this scenario is the use of a ladder in the wrong way to try and access the roof. The fall hazard of using a ladder to access the roof can be overcome by a control measure such as using a tower scaffold erected by an MOM approved contractor to go and access your roof. Now, you will need safe work procedures for your roof access. The fall hazard over here is that a person who is working on this temporary structure may fall off because it is not a properly erected scaffold. As mandated in the Workplace Safety and Health Work at Height Regulations, any hazardous work at height where a person could fall a distance of more than 3 metres will require a permit to work for work at height. Now what is the definition of hazardous work at height? In the regulations, hazardous work at height means work in or on an elevated workplace from which a person could fall in the vicinity of an opening through which a person could fall, in the vicinity of an edge over which a person could fall, on a surface through which a person could fall, or in any other place, whether above or below ground, from which a person could fall a distance of more than three meters. That is when you need a permit to work. Four sections that must be included in a new permit to work form should include one section called application to be completed by a supervisor another section called evaluation to be completed by the safety assessor one section called approval to be completed by the authorized manager and the last section which is task completion to be completed by a supervisor all these can be found in the Code of Practice for Working Safely at Heights. Can you see the hazard here? The worker is working on top of the materials that is stacked on the lorry and he has no fall protection at all. Safe work procedure is the way to overcome such a hazard. He could have done it from the ground instead of from up there. Can you all spot the work at height hazard over here? This is an open edge. It's a very, very major work at height hazard. An open edge such as this needs to be properly guarded by using sound materials of adequate strength that is able to withstand a 50 kgf force in order to protect workers from falling over that edge. Can you all spot the hazard in this scenario? The MEWP could overturn due to instability and due to poor housekeeping and the workers may fall out from the MEWP. The correct answer to this is that he should check the stability and housekeeping of the area and the workers should use personal fall protection equipment in the MEWP. Can you spot the hazard over here? Is this a proper barricade? This is not a proper barricade. This is not the correct way to guard a lift shaft. This is the correct and proper way to guard a lift shaft. Hard barricade, signage, tow box. Look at this scenario. The four hazards in this scenario Open edges, possible fragile roofs The worker could fall off without any protection This will happen across most of the roofs If they look like this in your work site Now what are some of the control measures that you can use? For one, you can have proper lifelines and anchorages The worker could be wearing a proper personal fall protection equipment and using it correctly. 
and he should have safer procedures for carrying out his work. If your workers were trying to access to work on the water sprinkler pipes above, the hazard that they face is that they may fall off while trying to access the water sprinkler pipes. What can you do? You can provide them with a safe working platform by using a scaffold that's erected by an approved scaffold contractor or you can use equipment such as an MEWP, such as this scissor lift over here. What are some of the control measures that you can use for working safely on roof? Number one, identify suitable anchorage points for anchoring your fall protection equipment for your workers. And two, you can provide a proper access for your workers to access the roof. Number three, safe work procedures for your workers who in the first place are supposed to know how they're supposed to carry out their work. Number four, have a permit to work system. That means have the supervisor apply for a permit to work from the occupier before working on the roof. Some other control measures that you can use in uh, working safely on roofs. Number one, you can identify whether or not you can use horizontal lifelines or vertical lifelines. Number two, you can see if your workers can use an adequate travel restraint while working on the roof. Number three, you can inspect the roof to see if there are any fragile surfaces or hazardous substance on the roof. Number four, you can provide temporary edge protection along the edge of the roof. One way to obtain a safety factor of two for your anchor is to reposition your anchorage. By repositioning your anchorage to a higher position, it will limit the free fall distance. You could also procure an anchor that has a higher static strength than the minimum one specified. You can also incorporate an energy absorber into your fall protection system. That will limit the force to 6 kN if you're using an EN or SS standard energy absorber. Access to the rooftop should come in the form of a properly erected stair access. Ideally, you should get it erected by an approved scaffold contractor. A proper access, proper guardrails, proper stairs, proper landing platform. Poor housekeeping produces many slip, trip and fall hazards. Good housekeeping prevents a lot of slip, trip and fall hazards. You know that the maintenance and inspection of your harness is very important. Now, one of those components that you do need to check is the webbing. So what do you check about the webbing on your harness? Number one, you check to see if there are cuts. Are there cuts on the harness? Is there discoloration on your harness? Like is it discolored? You gotta check the stitching. Has the stitching come out? You have to check if it is frayed. If a harness is frayed. You also gotta check for signs of chemical damage. And whether or not unauthorized marking of the harness has been made on the webbing. What is the difference between a fall arrest system and a fall prevention system? It is as such. A fall arrest system is meant to reduce the severity of the injury caused by the fall in the event of a fall. Such as the use of a full body harness with an energy absorbing lanyard. A fall prevention system prevents you from having the fall. It is collective systems such as guardrails on your structures. Common causes of accidents involving the use of ladders tend to be as such. 
The leather is not made of good construction, not made of sound material, and it's of inadequate strength. Ground that is not level or not firm enough. Defects such as broken rungs or cracks. And lastly, for someone failing to maintain three points of contact on the leather. The four categories of competent persons in a permit to work for work at heights is one, the worker, two, the supervisor of the work, three, the safety assessor, and lastly, the authorized manager. How should you equip your worker who is required to climb up a vertical ladder? One, he's wearing a full body harness with a front D-ring, a front attachment point. And he's using a fall arrester to be used with a vertical lifeline. Another fall protection equipment that he can use is a self-retracting lifeline. Okay, start. Yet another method that can be used is to use the twin lanyard that comes together with his full body harness and use the 100% tie-off method. This is a personal fall arrest system utilizing a twin lanyard connected to a horizontal lifeline. As you can see, there's nothing that is stopping the man from falling. It's just that he's anchored to a horizontal lifeline. This is a travel restraint system. The whole concept is that he cannot walk beyond the limit that he has set for his travel restraint system. This is a work positioning system. The system is taking his entire body weight. Now a work positioning system must not be used by itself. It must be used in conjunction with a personal fall arrest system such as the self-retracting lifeline or with a safety hook that is connected to his twin lanyard, that is connected to his body arm. Before using an MEWP, a site assessment is necessary. For example, the height of the area to work on, the leveling and foundation of the ground. The ground needs to be level, the height needs to be achievable by a correctly chosen machine. Have a look at this. A snap hook, energy absorber, twin lanyard. This is a certificate of test. It has the type and description of the lifting equipment 2 inch, 6.5 meters, ratchet strap with two number of large snap hooks on both ends It has a PE endorsement over here Now does this make it a valid certificate for a fall protection equipment such as a twin lanyard with energy absorber? It does not because this is a certificate of testing for a lifting equipment